To say that Lisa Willis is an incredibly decorated athlete is selling her short because her accomplishments on the floor are dwarfed by her drive and desire to make a positive impact on people's lives. Lisa is the first woman to coach in the New York Knicks organization. She's the author of the Amazon bestseller, When the Buzzer Sounds. And on top of all that, she's a performance and business strategist for corporations the world over. This is Man vs. Mood. Lisa, thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to Man vs. Mood. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. It's uh, pretty exciting for us, as we said just before we, we started, that uh, you are by far the most accomplished person that we have had on the podcast <laughs> before. And for us little guys in a small town, it's uh, pretty exciting to talk to someone that's been well, drafted in the top five of the WNBA and traveled all over Europe playing ball but I think that what you can what you can help us with is the leadership and really helping to find that way for guys and gals to have a positive reinforced uh, mental toughness in in the approach that they have on life because I think a lot of us are having that sucked out of us right now by many things going on in the world. So thank you very much. Where does this podcast find you? Let's start there. I am in Hillsboro, Oregon. Hillsboro, Oregon. Don't we all love Hillsboro? I used to live over in Beaverton. So. Really? Wow, okay. I lived over by Tannisborn. Okay, you all know okay. where that is? Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah. Tannisbrook Apartments back in the old days before there was all the houses and whatnot. But mm. So I, I think that the, the natural place to start is your your career in the WNBA being uh, are you still the all-time three-point leader at UCLA yes uh I believe a young lady tied my record but oh, no wow. one has beaten it wow Not, okay <laughs> do you know what the numbers are off the top of your head how many you you made or anything like that I don't ah that's good you don't want to know all of your statistics am I right <laughs> So you know Gary uh, a little bit. He's had a little chance to tell you about us. Is there anything that you would like to tell us off the top of the show that maybe would be interesting that we can't find on the internet? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> good question. I mean, at this point, it would be something completely random because all the the good stuff, I feel the need to share. So we're just going with Rand. Uh, I was named after my brother's kindergarten girlfriend. Wow. Okay. So that wow. well, we can just shut the show down right here because I don't think I've ever heard anyone named after a kindergarten girlfriend. Wow. Okay. How did that come about? First of all, why did he have a girlfriend in kindergarten? I wasn't like, going to so say it. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> so, yeah. Not for sure. But that's that is where that's how my name that's a uh, one of the most random facts i've ever learned about anyone i've never heard of that before that's very interesting lisa yeah so (laughs) you you were uh drafted fifth overall i believe in the 2006 uh nba draft and i i have a question about that because getting drafted into a professional league has got to be one of the most exhilarating experiences anyone could ever imagine what was that like for you though what was the feeling the were you excited nervous what was that like that day was just crazy i i went through so many different emotions that day um first of all i didn't even know i could sweat so much without physically exercising <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine that. Are you, now, where was the draft that year? Boston. Oh, wow. It was in Boston. Okay. And I got invited to the green room, which is the actual draft. And so that's a pretty good sign that you're going to get drafted if they actually ask you to come. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and so, you know, I was I played on the USA team um, the year before, and they were everybody on the team was talking about where – 
they were going to get drafted. And somebody said, yeah, Willis, you're probably going to get drafted number nine to this place. Like, me? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I, I never even dreamed of going to the WNBA. I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, then eventually a judge. But they invite you to the green room. They draft you. You go. Yeah. So, um, so I was thinking I was going to get drafted to Chicago. And they did the first four draft picks and then went to commercial. And then after commercial, it was the fifth draft pick, the L.A. Sparks. And during the commercial break, I was like, oh, crap, I want to play for L.A. Wow. Like, God, I just was happy to be there. And then at the commercial break, I was like, yo. Like, I leaned over to my mom, and I was like, mom, I want to go to L.A. And so at the um, – they come back from commercial, and now they're showing, like, highlight clips of who the L.A. Spark should pick. And so I'm sweating, like, I'm in a full summer. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm shaking. Uh, and they're telling all the reasons why they should draft me. And then I got drafted, seeing, you know, my family there, super happy, made me happy. Um, it was just super exhilarating but at the end of the night my family went back home I was staying to the next day it was just me and my agent in the Boston hotel and that was one of the loneliest moments I've ever had wow really like, yeah like arguably the biggest night of my life and my family wasn't there hmm. they were there just moments before but as things were starting to settle it was just me and my own thoughts with my new agent, I kind of know him, kind of trust him, but you're not my circle. Yeah. So that one day had a lot of different emotions going for me. Well, and I can imagine that you hadn't had a chance to really process what had just occurred, which is a major, major development in your life. And to not have that circle, as you just called it, right there to share it and kind of help you decompress after the lights of ESPN or whatever it was on. Once those cool off, you you know you're in reality again because it's kind of make believe in that TV land, right? So yeah. it's yeah, yeah, right. From there, and this is you know we'll we'll cover this quickly, but I think it's it's very important. From there, what is that leap like from being a college athlete to now you're playing in Los Angeles in the same building that Kobe plays in and. I mean, on the same floor. Yeah, that, I mean, that was one of the biggest leaps that I could have made because that's like um, going from, you know, I, I went from college to one of the best organizations in the whole league. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about because just the history of winning, the winning culture, like, that's a big jump. I went to UCLA. Yeah, and that's like, a that's a huge yeah, right. that's a huge deal too. Right. Yeah, but we weren't UConn, we weren't Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You know, we were UCLA women's basketball. So to go from there, where we had good players, but to like one of the best organizations, um, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Um, the mindset is is different because. Now we're fighting for insurance and our livelihood. Before, we were just trying to win because we were in school and we wanted to have grad rights and talk trash to USC. <laughs> now... <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So now it's like, no, like this is my job. This is my career. These people who are my teammates are actually competitors in a certain sense. Uh, this is my livelihood. So that shift... Well, it went from singing Kumbaya in college with your teammates to Game of Thrones with your teammates. Oh, wow. Now that is a hell of a mindset to to go from the everyone's kind of cool together to there's a chance that somebody's trying to beat me out and we're all doing this for a lot of money. Yeah. This is Mike. I have a question for you. Uh, so what was it like to play with Lisa Leslie and then also – what was the mental challenges that you had to face, um, you know, going pro and playing with some of these stars that have been out there for a long time? Yeah, so it was pretty cool playing with Lisa. Um, 
because she's just one of the pioneers. She's one of the goats of mm-hmm. women's basketball. Um, I was at a pretty complete game. And so one thing that I could do was I could shoot well and I could pass the ball and I'm six feet. When, you know, putting me on the same side of the court as Lisa Leslie, that means they can't double team. Mm-hmm. And so, and I was, so I was taller, so that means I can get her the ball. So she enjoyed playing with me. And because of that, I got more playing time. Um, her husband shared with me yeah. and it was just cool. Um, I went from being like a shooter to just keeping my gun loaded just in case I get the opportunity to shoot. And that was a little bit tough, but you know, as you're trying to move up, you have to do what they need you to do until you can do what you actually want to do. Um, a mental, a yeah, mental like, challenge. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead and finish on the mental challenges. Cause I think that's an important thing for us to hear. Yeah. A, a mental challenge was, was, you know, wanting to be coached uh, at that level, the coaching looked very differently, uh, and I needed to adapt to that. Uh, Kobe's dad, Jelly Bean, he was my coach, and so I'm eager beaver, and I'm like, yo, like, what do I need to be able to get more playing time to do this, that, and the third? And he's like, you're a professional. That's so not helpful, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so kind of being there in a team atmosphere, but feeling like you're on an island for so many reasons. Again, it's the Game of Thrones and your coach is like, you're a professional and no one in my circle has been where I'm at. So I can't really look to them. So, you know, you have to, I I really had to dig for um, just grounding and strength and courage even uh, just to go out there and give it my best, knowing that some days I might not suit up and some days I might have 12 points. That's a that's a huge deal. Yeah, it's so cool that you got to play with Lisa Leslie. I mean, for me, like I look back and some of my favorite like WNBA players like Lisa Lobo and Cynthia, you know, Poles or, or Cheryl Swoops and, uh, <laughs> you know, like Shamika Holesclaw and stuff like that. I mean, I, I used to love to watch, you know, some of these players. And for you, you know, like whether it was high school or college or WNBA or anything, like who would you say is your, your most impactful teammate that you played with? Impactful teammate. Wow. That's a great question. Um, mm, 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 mm. And and the only reason that I asked that was because I was listening to an audio book today and um, it was talking about like John Wooden and UCLA and Bill Walton and all these things. And somebody asked Bill Walton who was his favorite, you know, person that challenged him for the year. And his person that he picked was this person that nobody even knew of. It was this like seven foot guy that like, you know, just helped him out in practice and stuff like that and was really helpful for him to get him, you know, where he needed to get to and stuff. So, so I figured, you know, if you had a player like anybody that just helped you in your, you know, transition to college or the WNBA or somebody that, you know, pushed you off the court or anything like that. Yeah, I have, um, this, this is actually a new discovery. Um, one of my favorite teams, um, I knew she was, but in answering your question for impact, I would say that this young lady was probably impactful as well. Uh, her name is Noelle Quinn. Uh, we played three years at UCLA together. Now she she played in the W, and now she's the coach for the Seattle Storm. Okay, well. um, one thing that she told me, and if she were to ever watch this, she would be blown away. She has no idea. Uh, like I said, I just but she taught me how to be myself Mm. like there's many different kinds of leaders and she was she was a great leader she was always sweet she was soft-spoken but she walked in who she was and that was that wasn't typical for a star like especially back in the day like to be the team captain or to be that go-to person on the team you think about michael jordan how 
how brutal he was to his teammates or Kobe Bryant, who was like super tough on his teammates. And you hear all these horror stories about these star athletes. And when I looked at her, that showed me that I could just come and be myself. And no matter how I approached my situation um, or the, the team, as long as I was being myself, I could have, no, I don't want to say as long as I was being myself. As I am being myself, that still has a great impact on my team. That's uh, that's something that I think a lot of people don't quite think about is how hard it can be to be yourself in that atmosphere. We talked about L.A. in general is you know kind of known for being fake, but for you to be comfortable in your own skin on that floor, but then also to begin learning about leadership tactics and things like that that were going to impact your life after your career. Cause ultimately you knew that your career was not going to go until you're 50 years old, likely. So when do you think you started right. to really um, think about how you're, you're going to make that leap to the leadership? And, and is that something that you knew right away when you were younger that you wanted to get into, or was it something that you developed as your career pro progressed? Yeah, it was something that was developed. Um, and I say that because the, the social, emotional, and mental um, topics that I discuss now stem from my college experience. I didn't feel valued. I didn't feel heard and appreciated. There are so many things that I was looking for externally, and because I wasn't getting them externally, that impact how I felt. In retrospect, a lot of those things needed to have been cultivated and grounded within me, you know? And so when we talk about, you know, work versus value, it's important that we decide, you know, what our worth is. People will value it however they value it, but there's a there's an internal component where we need to be grounded and we need to give ourselves permission to, to be happy or to be sad, you know, or to go after it that and so um me wanting to i don't know we'll say protect or help athletes navigate through some of these emotions that i dealt with was my reason for speaking up and taking this further because if i dealt with this and i was arguably a star i know so many people are dealing with some of these worth issues and identity issues the identity issues are huge and for someone of your stature, when you are a leader to children, and I know that was a big part of, and is currently a big part of, of your career and what your goals are is to help kids. How has that um, affected you being a role model? Because I think a lot of people, when they become a professional athlete, the, whether it's money, fame, whatever it might be, kind of goes to their head. And you've talked about the leadership, but how did you really decide to keep yourself grounded and know that, hey, I'm not going to let the the talents I have on the floor uh, make me kind of feel like I'm better than everyone? I was grounded before my talents were realized. Oh, wow. And I, I you know, what makes it different. Um, it's different to to ground yourself when when people are elevating you mm -hmm. you know you need to be grounded with you know I, I would say my family they supported me in a way and always made me feel that anything was possible but also and that I am great and that I am special and that everybody needs to be treated a certain kind of way and we all have different things about us that makes us great, you know. Um, so while I'm special, I'm not special because we all have something to bring to the table. Um, I also feel that the money didn't get to me, um, how it gets to some other people, because I came from a middle class family. So I didn't get everything that I wanted, but I wasn't worried about my next meal. Mm -hmm. And so I let pretty good life so that once I did get money, I didn't have to go out and buy a lot of things that, you know, I always wanted since I was 12, you know, so that 
that also so and then i'm playing in the w we're not making the same kind of money like the nba guys make so you could only you you might be able to get one lamborghini your whole career <laughs> <laughs> one's better than none <laughs> that's true <laughs> so uh this is Gary. So I ran into you a couple of weeks ago at the Nike Poop Summit game, and we're we're sitting here talking about you know just money and staying grounded and stuff like that. What was your message? Um, you know, I I definitely noticed you sitting right behind the bench and stuff like that for the game. So, did you get a chance to uh, talk talk to some of the kids? And what was some of your or you know what was some of your words of wisdom or you know what and what kind of things did you try to put into them and talk to them about? Yeah, so I did not talk to any of those athletes on that day. Mm -hmm. um, but I do talk to college. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have too many NBA players that I know mm -hmm. personally. I have G League mm -hmm. college, high school. Um, and my message is always, you know, figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to you decide on who you are. And you have to give yourself the the grace to accept that you know uh those are things that i personally struggled with and so it's like when you're not okay with just this small area in, in your life it then becomes a big thing and then it starts to manifest itself in other ways and it's just like yo you're enough just how you are today you are enough there are always opportunities for growth, but you are enough. And so let's appreciate where we're at and love where we're at. Because with those things, anything that you do is going to be amazing. You're going to walk out, start snowing, all of, I mean, starts raining all of a sudden because we're in Portland. And you're going to be like, you know what? That's fine because I'm enough. Mm -hmm. Like, you're just going to, any room you walk in, you're going to be okay because you're understanding where your um where your worth and your approval and your happiness comes from that comes from within you know and so when you have that going for you you're good hmm. uh so you know you're talking about your worth and everything and, and knowing where that came from how how did that come across for you because like for will for mike I'm Mike and then Gary, how for us, we didn't have that strong support system growing up. And so we kind of had to figure it out on our own. And that's why we do this podcast because we didn't figure it out very well. And, you know, we're trying to get other guys to open up and to kind of see within. So how, how did you have that modeled for you growing up? Yeah, my family instilled a lot of great stuff. Um, you know, I, I have a great character predominantly because of my family and basketball. Um, but there were still things that they couldn't help. You know, when it comes to me accepting myself for so long, I was doing things or not doing things to please them. Mm -hmm. So they weren't going to be the one to save me. It had to be me. And the way that I did it, um, I was about to turn 30 years old and I was like, yo, like, I'm 30 years old and I'm still trying to please my family. That's so not cool. Hmm. And so I had to start looking internally at why. Like, and you just got to keep asking yourself why until you can't. And, um, you know, some things came out for me. I've cried, I, you know, prayed. But once I really decided, like, look, you need to love yourself. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. Then what helped me with that was my relationship with God. I've been on a radical spiritual journey with God for the last almost eight years. And when I was really able to, to make a stride was when I started to look at myself or at least try to see myself the way that God sees me. Hmm. When I did that, then it was like, well, that's not flawed, but, you know, these these are the things that are great about me, and this is why God created me. He knows this. And who can judge me above God? So if God still loves me, knowing more of my flaws than I can even imagine, then who am I to say that's not enough? You know, and so that's, that's kind of how I... 
Yeah, that that is an incredible message and one that I'm sure that you try to relate to, whether it's professionals or kids. Today, we see social media have a tremendous impact on the value people have in themselves. And I think that that's from kids to adults. And you've seen that change since 2006 and to where we sit today. How do you attack that with with your clients? How do you help them to battle that, which is, I mean, it's dominating our lives. It's hard to say anything less than that if, if we're really being honest with ourselves, I think. Yeah, personal development is key in anything that you're doing. Even when I was training athletes, there was always a personal development component that they probably didn't, no, I'm positive they didn't realize it was happening. Um, but I get them to look at who they are. You know, just tell me, like, who are you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, so then you start saying, I'm a basketball player, I'm a this, I'm a that. Okay, so once, once we strip away all the things that actually can be taken away from you, like these titles and these relationships, then who are you? And so then as you get the person to think about what's important to them and where their value systems lie, that helps them to come into relationship with themselves. Like we let so many people have a relationship, with us, but we don't have a relationship with us. Right. And so that these other people are relating to really isn't even us because we're not intentional about what we're putting out there, you know? And so I just first start with looking at who I am and I try to get my players or whoever I'm working with, even professionals to look at who they are, because that's literally the core of anything that's going to come from us. Are you, do you think that you have more of a challenge with kids or with adults trying to get that across to them? It's a great question. It's tough with both because I, I think both present different challenges. Adults have a lot of trauma or un, un, um, unresolved. Think, yeah, unresolved. Thank you unresolved issues and they become set in their ways and they have defense mechanisms to protect them from certain things. And so it's really difficult, even though they want to, it's really difficult to, to help them to, you know, peel back some of these layers. Whereas kids, part of them don't know how to articulate what exactly they're feeling. Part of them are trying to figure it out. Like they have, much to pull from and so it is easier in that sense but there's almost a, um what is it called like oh man what was i gonna say um sheesh I just well, lost it. we can come back to that because i mean there's a million different ways we can approach that both both of them like you said have severe challenges and i think that the challenges are going to e get even greater your book, learning that you were an author. I think that that is one of the greatest achievements any person on, on earth can, can actually get through and, and accomplish to publish a book. It doesn't matter if it's 10 pages or 10,000 pages to be able to articulate what is in your mind in a clear and conscious way for other people to understand is very difficult. For you, what was that process like? And was it a short process, long years, months? What did that look like for you? Yeah, so the process, um, the process was, was pretty cool content wise because I've been doing um, workshops and professional speaking for a while. Mm -hmm. And so the topics, you know, that I would talk about, whether it was at an elementary school or a corporate five, um, a 500 company, mm -hmm. the, the crux of what I was talking about was the same. And so I took all of those things and I said, you know, we're going to make a book about this, but we're going to do it from the perspective of an athlete. Because one thing that gets me into these corporations is that I'm speaking through sports and for some reason, corporations love athletes. And so I thought forward to them really important things. Um, so the content 
that was that was pretty sad. Um, writing the book itself, it, I had some challenges with that because it's like, okay, well, what's the format that you want to have? And you do want to incorporate stories. And so I kind of went back and forth on that. But I would say the most difficult part is when I finished the book, I let my sister read the manuscript. She said, this is a good book, but it's not great. You can go deeper. Wow. And I was just like, I mean, but it's good, right? <laughs> and she's like, but because I know you, she said, other people would think it's great. But because my sister knows me so deeply, she's like, I see all these areas that you could go deeper. And that's going to save somebody's life. And that's what you want the book to do. So digging deep, I cried. I had to really address some of the things that I would wanted my author. I mean, I wanted, and that was tough. That's that's incredibly tough. So the the transition going from um, WNBA to the corporate world, like, how was that? Like, was it pretty difficult? And when you made that transition, did you kind of think about the benefits for? Um, women going from the WNBA to the to like a, a corporate career? Yeah, so my my transition was difficult for different reasons. Um, my career ended abruptly. I blew my knee out and I told myself, well, I just need to get a new job. So part of my identity struggle was not wanting to be looked at as a basketball player. Long story short, I was in the eighth grade and I had become eligible, ineligible. While at a magnet school, I became ineligible because I didn't apply myself. Um, I was goofing off. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of embarrassment that I felt made me just not want to be looked at as a basketball player because I was like, they're gonna look at me like, this is all I know how to do. Like, I'm not smart. And so being ineligible, uh, that those feelings carry with me through life all the way through retirement. And so once I retired, I couldn't be devastated that I was retiring because that would be too much like a job. Mm -hmm. And so I tell myself, well, I'm just gonna get a new job. And so I tried to fill a really big void and call it a job or career with something else to make money. And um, dealing with that void, or I guess not dealing with that void, that was the difficult part for me. So I found myself saying, well, you know, everything's in God's control. God knows what he's doing. And I'm quoting all the scriptures to get me through. And I'm saying all the right things while inside I had a big void. Um, so my... I, I had an emotional struggle, but nobody could really see. It was all internal. That's the the toughest thing a lot of us face is having to look in that mirror and say, I know the truth. Everyone else might know it, and I might be on TV and do all these things, but they don't know what I know. And to get where you were, no matter who you are, I don't, I don't care if you only play one minute in a professional league to be a professional, to get play, paid to play takes a special type of, of mindset, but the mindset of having that all taken away from you in literally one split second, when you had that knee injury, what is the, how devastating was that for you? And how did you rebuild yourself after that? It took almost a decade to rebuild myself, wow. I would say. And and oddly enough, in that decade, I did a lot of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I've done amazing things, but for me, it, again, like, like we just said, we don't, other people don't know what I'm going through. So other people can be like, oh man, you had a great transition. And it's like, why, because I have a new job? Mm -hmm. You know the transition. What people what people fail to realize is that change and transition are two different things. The change is going to happen, 
but how you get from one place to the next, how you actually manage that change, that's the transition and that's where it becomes mental and emotional. And so um, that was tough. I literally told myself at that moment, I'm never going to get a job again that requires my body. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, never. Because if anything happens, it could be a car accident. It could be I could fall down the stairs. I don't want to feel the way that I felt that moment. At that moment, my livelihood changed. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I had money in my savings to take care of me. But how am I going to make money playing basketball now with no ACL, MCL, or LCL? Hmm. You know, um, so yeah, my, my mindset shifted immediately and one of the sad things was it was like well now you get to do what you want to do a lot of athletes don't know what they like to do outside of their sport and so i try to encourage them like okay but what else okay but what else you know because it's really hard trying to find out uh figure out when you're 27 years old what you like to do why did you decide to go um towards this path leadership and and leading people rather than going back to school and becoming an attorney, which was originally what you had on your mind. Yeah, so I had already, since college, I had been doing professional speaking. And so, you know, I had some years of that under my belt. But when when it came time, when the dust settled, I'll say, um, I did go back to school for my MBA. Oh, okay. I didn't have the desire to become a lawyer anymore. The idea was to become a lawyer than a judge. I didn't have that desire anymore. Um, And so I was like, well, what's something that will help me make some good money? So I was going to be a a CPA. So kind of back to the book. Um, So, you know, we're not professional athletes. We were, well, Gary, you know, we call him sweaty because, you know, he has a sweaty issue, but, uh, (laughs) No, we is this book for just for the athletes or is it for someone that maybe is out of a relationship, is divorced and is struggling to find out who they are now that they're single or they've lost their job and they're in a career change or if they have a or they have had a devastating injury and are now, you know, paralyzed or whatever. Can you get into that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And that is a great question. Uh, because so many people who who know me, but they don't play any sports, they bought the book because they wanted to support me. And the feedback that I would get would be phenomenal because they were like, we were reading the book because we wanted to hear about your story, but this chapter really helped me. And chapter, and so I get really good feedback from people who are not athletes. Um, this book is about transition. This book is about social, social, emotional well-being. It's just being spoken about through the lens of a basketball player, through storytelling. However, the first chapter is called Role Versus Identity. That is not an issue that only athletes face. You have doctors, you have millionaires, you have all different types of people who don't understand that those are two different things. Your job can change at any moment. The hats that you wear can change at any moment. Who you are, that's what you really have control over, you know? And so keep those separate. The next chapter the next chapter is worth versus value. Again, where are you getting your sense of self from? That's not an athlete thing. No, it's something we talk about a lot right here. Exactly. Exactly. And so if you are coming from a divorce, now it's like, okay, well, you really need to be building up yourself because your husband or wife or your in-laws family or whoever you thought you were that was giving you that validity, that's not there anymore. But you still have to go, go on and be great. You know, next chapter, acceptance. We are, so my point is these are these are issues that people deal with. It's just being spoken about in a way um, that you can understand through sports. One of the reasons I picked up the book is, you know, I was reading through your uh, LisaCWillis.com. That's where you can go find the book and order it. Um, But I was looking on there and I saw this book isn't to teach you great skills. It's to bring out the awareness of the great skills you already 
uh, possess. And so that, that to me like spoke volumes because I'm like, wow, maybe I do have some skills and I'm not just a dad or I'm not just a realtor or I'm not just a divorced uh, person or, you know, that, that to me is, gives me some hope in some, uh, just, I'm, I don't know. I'm just excited to read it. And, uh, you know, it's, I haven't, I haven't gotten it yet, but maybe one of these days I can meet up with you and get a signed copy or something like that. <laughs> right. Nice. Nice. That That's really important to me because we minimize the things that we've done. Yes. We minimize our experiences and it's like, Oh, it's just a gold medal. Oh, it's just, I had twins. Oh, it's just, I graduated from my dream school for free. Oh, it's just, like, we have all these things that because it's so familiar to us, it's just like, oh, I just, but the reality is that, no, like, we are equipped to do epic stuff. Like, when it talks about being a leader, if you were the captain of your team, you know, or if you were responsible, if you were the equipment manager, or if you are a parent, or if you are, like, we're leaders, and we know how, I mean, I, I'm trying, like, to contain myself because I was about to get, like, real geeked up about it. Don't like, do it. Geek out. <laughs> like, we got it in us. But we do. <laughs> like, all of our experiences, if you take, you know, some of these defining moments for us uh, in our lives and we actually define them. Like, what school, what skills can I extract from that? you will be like, yo, like. Because I dealt with this, I'm equipped to go deal with that. And I just am using the book to help people bridge those things. Like, you did that. So if then, that's that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Man, this is just so cool to sit in here and listening to you talk. Like, I just hear the passion and I just, I just love this. And I just think, you know, like, I'm so thankful just to have you on our show. And thank you again. And I think, um, man, you've just done so many amazing things, you know, from coaching to playing in the WNBA to being an author and all these things. But I think personally for me, one of the most amazing things that I've seen you do is when you posted that video on TikTok and you were giving that guy the hezzy in low top <laughs> Air Maxes, was that? And you didn't roll your ankle or knee or anything? Because for me, we're, we're, we're talking about rolls and stuff like that. Man, I couldn't even do that. Because <laughs> like I said, I would have rolled my ankle right there on the spot. <laughs> he would have he would have tore everything in both knees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so for me to see, uh, you know, the, the love and passion and stuff, you know, that you still have for the game and that you're still out there playing is amazing. I love that. I appreciate that. I was really thankful to make it out. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the the biggest challenge, um, and this doesn't have to be professionals that you work with, but for adults that you come across, what do you think the biggest um, challenge, whatever you want to call it, for them to finally accept the message that you're telling them, which is to focus on themselves and that they're good people. Because I think a lot of us, I know, I mean, I know for me, self-esteem and actually believing that kind of stuff is a hell of a lot harder than hearing it. And actually, because mm -hmm. actually like getting in there and doing the hard work is, is really tough. So what, what do you think that you see from, from the standpoint of a person leading those people what do you think that that we need to hear the most? That's a great question. And I, I say that because I don't I don't want to say that, you know, people need to hit rock bottom. What and, and rock bottom is different for a lot of people. But you need to feel like like I, I say when somebody is fed up, you know. You know, so if it's if it's your homeboy who keeps having issues with his girl, it, I'm done. OK, cool. But when you're fed up, then we'll know because you're looking for ways to change. I think that people there is there's really nothing that I can do to help you be fed up. All I can do is keep giving you the information in different ways. And one of those ways are going to click and that and at that moment you're going to say you know what i want more for myself 
you know, um, because your show is designed to help men have or to help people have an outlet to just even say, okay, I'm not alone. Because that's one thing we we feel like we're the only person in the whole world going through this, you know. And so as you, you're not, you're not going to, I don't want to say you're not going to save anybody. I want to say your information is going to be the life jacket that somebody needs when they're ready to lift their, lift their hands and grab it, you know. But if they don't lift their hands to grab it, then what we do, it doesn't matter. That, that that's is beautiful. yeah that and that's so true and it's something that Gary has touched on a number of times because there are people that think what we're doing is a joke and so from your standpoint do you get pushback from these professionals the kids whomever it might be that that think that mental health awareness and and believing in themselves and oh to hell with that I'll just do it my way and and you're full of baloney how, how do you deal with that? How do you, or is it something you have encountered? Yeah, it's, it's different in my field because if you verbalize that, you will be ousted so quickly. Really? So working in the NBA and now I work at Nike, you can't say that, mm-hmm. you know, like it's literally embedded in us that we need to care. So it shows up differently though. You know, um, so if somebody thinks that, you know, mental health is this whatever, it's just, they might make a sly remark like, here we go again, or uh, she's just, or he's just, like, they'll minimize and try to be joking, but not joking. You know, it'll show up like that, but they'll never actually say this is baloney. And I think that's actually even worse because now, you know, you're beating around the bush about how you feel. Um, but what I, I don't encounter it as much, but I even have friends who, you know, call me a therapist, like, oh, here comes the therapist, uh, Dr. Willis, tell them, (laughs) I hope you're not like trying to downplay what I'm doing because I'm serious and I'm only doing it because I care about you or about whoever I'm about to give this, you know, opinion with. But at the same time, I also can't care about anybody that's not on my bandwagon. You know, I can only put out the information and, and again, do you, just like you won't be for everybody. Yep. And, and that isn't our goal or, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. Our goal is to be the light, but they've got to walk towards it. We, we're not going to go, you know, grab them by the hand and, and drag them kicking and screaming because those are not the type of people that ever want to listen anyway. They've already mm-hmm. made up their mind about what we or you are about. Lisa, this is, uh, this is flown by. We appreciate your time so much. We don't want to take up your entire evening because I'm sure we could fill another two or three hours. But as a, do you have a parting message for us or anything that you would you know, like the listeners to, you know, to understand about you or just take away from, from what your message is? Yeah, my my message is always that I am enough and you are enough. People think that I'm cool because I played basketball. But when you look at that, that basketball experience, like I'm good at a game. If I could take my experiences from playing a game and try to go do something else with it, then everybody else can take their, their experiences from whatever they've lived and make something of that. And when I say make something of it, it's whatever your desires are. We get to define what success is like. And I don't need your approval for what ex- for what success looks like for me. So just know like we're equipped to go after the dreams that God has given us because of what we've already come through. Those are amazing words. Gems. Man, she she really gave us some gems today, and what you're talking about, like I think I'm gonna listen to this show probably 35 times, and we recommend <laughs> everyone else 70 times because whatever 
Gary does, we have to do twice as better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was I was looking up all of your, you know, past history with school and basketball and, and your career and, you know, the book. But I think the coolest thing about you, Lisa, is that you have a heart to give back to other people. Yes. And you have that avenue to be able to do that. And so to me, that speaks volumes for the type of person that you are. And so it's been an honor and a uh, privilege to be able to talk to you and ask questions and just get to know a little bit more about you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, everyone, you can get her book. It's When the Buzzer Sounds on Amazon or on her website, LisaCWillis.com. Am I right? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much again for joining us. And I hopefully we can bring you back on another time to go over whatever new and exciting things or, or leadership or anything like that, because this has been incredible. And I would, I would imagine that we're going to have some people that would like to hear more from you. So thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Boy, guys, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know about you, but um, to have somebody, like we said just a moment ago, so willing to share her trials, tribulations, the the thought process of writing a book, whatever it might be. But I think the biggest takeaway that I had from it was the focusing on just being who you are. And, and that is enough because once we are able to do that, we are centered and everything else is easy from there, I think, right? Even though it's very hard to do. I don't even know if it's that easy, honestly. I mean, no, I, I don't think it's easy. I, <laughs> I think she I, makes it sound easy, mm -hmm. yeah. but you could hear her faith in God and her, mm -hmm. her faith is a huge part of who she is mm -hmm. and where she found out who she is because of what he says about us in the Bible. And, uh, you know, a lot of my identity has been tied around to what I have and have not done with like work relationships, um, fatherhood, you know, those things. So a lot of times, you know, when we're stuck in the muck, we, we focus on the negative, but when you strip all that away, kind of like what she was saying is who are we really, you know? And, and I don't even know if I could answer that for myself. It's something that I have been more in tune with. Um, and I am finally starting to, I, I think I'm about actually 85 or 90% there. Um, but she also hit the nail on the head when she said you have to hit rock bottom because it, you have to have your ego completely stripped away. Um, and for you to actually open your eyes to understand the reality of, of your situation and that the things that you had convinced yourself of in the past to make your life easier, you have to confront those lies. Yeah. Yeah. That was just so amazing. Like I'm just sitting here thinking about some of the things, you know, we just talked about. And I think that it's, it's so, it's so helpful for like a multitude of different people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about from an athlete's perspective, we're talking about from a parent's perspective, from, you know, like a coach, like, anybody and anything and I think there was just so many gems I just think that that was so great and one of the things she she mentioned was you know she was a WNBA player she was a coach but these things can apply to you you know if you're a real estate agent if you're a garbage man if you're a door greeter at at Walmart you know we all gotta have a certain uh, stigma to us and, and for ourselves to carry on to keep getting better and better and I thought it was also wonderful to hear that it took her so long. A decade. To, yeah, to get through that journey. Yeah. And, and I think that that helps a lot of people to understand that even when you have incredible physical talents, and, and whether we want to admit it or not, we are judged in society by our physicality, mm -hmm. how we look, mm -hmm. how we perform physically, mm -hmm. um, because you don't have math elites headlining seven o'clock Saturday night shows. Mm -hmm. You have athletes because mm -hmm. going back to the Roman times, that was what entertained the people. And so to see somebody that... What, I was just thinking of, you know, gladiator. gladiator. Are you not entertained? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but to, to see somebody that has had to endure, I mean, that the, the whole injury thing, I've talked to a number of athletes about that and how how they have dealt with it. All of them deal with it differently. Um, I think we see the big athletes, um, some of them completely fall apart and their life is a 
fucking disaster for the rest of it or they they take the path that lisa has which is it's a bumpy road but they are determined to travel it even though it's hard but also too like i feel like um personally for myself i've heard of so many stories of professional athletes you know their their life is football their life is boxing their life is basketball so once they lose that they kind of fall off the edge and they kind of lose it you know because you're so used to you know training and playing for seven months out of the year or nine months out of the year and i i found it so interesting just from people that i reached out to at nike that just say she is amazing she is so helpful and the person that we heard today on the show was the person that she is to everybody yeah you know, extremely giving and caring. And I think that that goes back to her childhood, you know, and how, you know, how she was raised. And then that kind of transitions into, you know, her challenging herself to become a better person. Um, that's amazing. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking, thinking about what you just said, Gary, and in, even though we didn't have that growing up, there are people around nowadays that are, are so giving like she is that we don't have to have that when we were five, 10, 15, 20, now that you're at this age, you can still use that because you still have another 50, 60 years left on your life, you know? So just because you didn't learn it young, doesn't mean you can't learn it. You know, you can teach an old dog new tricks. So absolutely. And I think that the biggest thing for, especially for the three of us, um, having confronted the issues we've had with our childhood is to let go of it and not let that define us, not let those people, who very likely could still be involved in our life. Mm-hmm. Let them, what their definition of us is play any part in our life. And I think that was a very, very tall order for me was to finally understand that what they want or thought of me matters not at all. And I had to get over that and it's very hard, but once you do, and, and I know I came at things from a, more brash um confrontational way when i just say fuck it all um but for me that's what works not everyone needs to take that path but that's how for me to to really accept it and understand it is to just say fuck it it doesn't matter anymore and to move on to but to never forget that it's there or that it occurred but to just let it go, you know, yeah. I always think of that fucking Frozen song, let it go, let it go. but it, it's the truth. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that's very, very hard for us. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, through this whole journey that we've been on, um, you know, where we started at the coffee shop and then started with just the two of us in your kitchen and, you know, then out of Gary and Jen. And now we've been interviewing guests and things like that. The transition and the process that we're going on is just it's pretty cool because through this whole process you know we're also uncovering a lot of who we didn't even know who we were yeah you know and and getting to the bottom of that but then you know kind of like what she said in in that thing that i mentioned earlier about the great skills that we already possess you know i've had no idea that we could do something like this i thought i would have to learn how to podcast or to you know changed my life by going through another divorce and career change and, you know, different things like that. So it's been a, it's been a journey and it's been a learning process, but it's been, I'd say it's been fun. Oh yeah. And not, I'm not saying it's not been hard, but it's definitely been, been fun to be, to see that I, that I am able to overcome things and you are, and you are, and, and other people that are out there. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's so cool. And that it's, um, it's always you're always in motion it's never settled it's never over the journey the path how, whatever word you want to use to describe it there is not an end point to improving yourself and being happier that doesn't mean that you're avoiding the painful things because that's part of being happy is not avoiding the painful things but i think that that's what i've always wanted for us is to have our listeners go if they wanted to go back to the first one i mean this is the 29th show man that was that was brutal on our sound on oh, the yeah. first couple 
Yeah, it is what it is. At you least just... me for me, you sounded great. You couldn't hear me because I was so far away from the microphone. Sound like yeah, Gary on his I first just couple. <laughs> crank up your gain. <laughs> but you, you know, you can hear us change over twenty nine weeks, maybe a little bit longer. But you you can see a progression, and I hope that in another twenty nine weeks or fifty eight weeks or whatever it might be that you continue to hear that progression and not a regression. And that's something that we all have to remember that, yeah, there are going to be steps back. I have steps back every week, but I keep pushing forward Mm -hmm. one way or another. What are we thankful for boys? We need to, we need to, when you cannot use the interview, I'm laying down the law. So, so what I'm thankful for, um, well, tonight's the draft. Yeah, right. The, Who's going to be number one? Who knows? I mean. It's not going to be the Oregon guy. They were saying, on Thibodeau. He's yeah. going to fall to number whatever the Seahawks Nine. are picking. Nine. <laughs> they were saying maybe Hutchinson, but I think there was another dude, like another it's end. Be Is that Steve Hutchinson's son? Yeah. yeah. Oh, from, okay. for Michigan? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. But, yeah, I mean, there's Aiden. there's so many good guards, and there's, I don't know, there's, there, there's just so many good players. And receivers. Receivers. Quarterbacks. And, Defensive end, no, nah, I, I wouldn't Linebackers. say quarterback. So I think more of Kenny, me. Kenny Pickett, baby, my man from Pitt. Yeah, but he, I think that the the draft for quarterbacks is going to be better next year. Yes, I think much better actually. Um, and hopefully the Seahawks do the right thing. I mean, don't trade out of the first round. We'll see. Um, but anyways, one of the the stories that I heard was I was reading about uh, uh Warwick Dunn and um. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, and straight out of Tampa Bay, right? And I always knew about him. Mm-hmm. You know, and I knew Florida about his, State. Yeah, exactly. You know, he he went to Florida State and played for Bobby Bowden, and he played with Dion. Yeah, and um, yeah, just his. I mean, he's that old. Oh yeah. His sure. uh, are you gonna bring him on the show, Gary? Man, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> his uh, his uh, story is just so exciting, just from a, a stature point. You know, because he's like five eight, one hundred and seventy yep. or one hundred and seventy five pounds or something like that playing running back Mm -hmm. and um, And playing it very very well exactly he was the 22nd person or something like that to rush for 10,000 yards Mm -hmm. and to be you know for a football standpoint for athletics standpoint that's just small that's oh yeah and um for him to do that is just amazing and um one of the things that I thought about you know was just where did he get this from you know like where uh, where did it come from and and when he was being recruited by uh, Bobby Bowden, him and his mom, you know, went uh, went and talked to the coach, and they had a great time. Like everything went well, like everything was amazing. And then he, you know, told the coach, "I'm coming down to Florida State." Two weeks later, his mom was at a bank and was murdered. No kidding. So here's work done. Eighteen years old, with six brothers and sisters. Damn. And now I did know that he had a big family. Yeah, and um. You know, Bobby Bowden called him and said, this is a lot to take on, you know, for an 18-year-old. Are you sure you still want to come down? And and work done said, that was the promise that I made to my mom, that I'm going to come down, I'm going to go down and play. So he ended up going down there and playing there, you know. He took his two youngest siblings with him and took on the challenge of going to school, playing football, you know, being a huge big, big brother and – to me, like this story was just amazing, you know, because it just talks about psychological fortitude. You know, it kind of talks about some of the things that uh, Lisa talked about. You know, it's a, it's more of like a like an athlete thing. And for the the longest time too, um, he he couldn't even talk about you know what happened with his mom or anything. And then essentially he he went and met you know with the guy that did it, you know, that killed his mom and stuff. And really, he was at um some prison like in louisiana or something and apparently 91 percent of the people that go there don't make it out because you either die in there or you you know yeah yeah exactly and um you know he just went down there and they were all you know sitting and talking and i'm just thinking for myself like i'm not at that level to sit there and talk to somebody that you know killed a loved one or, or anything like that so i mean you know just with it being draft day and you know just yeah, uh, you know, like with with talking to Lisa, I just had to share that story because it was so you know impactful and just uh, you know 
just about hitting barriers and just jumping over the barriers and continuing just to go. I think it's important, you know, for everybody to hear that, you know, because we all come to, you know, issues, whether it be getting fired, going through a divorce or just anything. Absolutely. Mike, yeah. what about you? That's tough to follow. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, mine's not that heavy, but uh, I'm actually grateful that I am starting to see the changes from putting the hard work out in the gym. And nice. You know, I'm starting to see the changes there and my muscles and my body is changing and other people are starting to notice. And so I'm just like, oh, I guess I'll stick with it. You know, yeah, I think that's probably look, a good idea. Yeah. Your your legs looked amazing on the last show. They did. Shut up. <laughs> are you shaving them again or is it Nair? Wow. You're a Nair. Wax. Wax on, wax <laughs> off. Nair, Nair burns. So I don't know. Do How Nair. do you know? Shh. <laughs> that's not Nair. <laughs> wow hooked up with a burner <laughs> Jeez, Gary. well i guess i gotta follow the burner so <laughs> i'm thankful for one of our former guests mr brett collie uh i want to say i'm thankful for him because he he texts me every morning and says have a great day you know something uplifting mm -hmm. and that's what i appreciate about brett is just whether he's having a great day, whether he's having a not great day, he knows that by lifting others up, he is going to make his day better. Yeah. And I really appreciate that, Brett. So I just wanted to give him a shout out because that that means a lot to me. Um, it's hard to convey emotion through text sometimes, but uh, in fact, I sent him a goat this morning. So that I didn't know if that got my emotion across. It was a goat <laughs> drinking out of a drinking fountain. But anyway, I just want to give uh, Brett his, or just thank him because it does mean a lot to me. So, well, guys, this has been a big show. It's been a lot of fun. You have any parting words for us, Gary? Man, this was so good. Um, you know, like you're I'm, shaking. I just, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm just. He's, just, ampl he's yeah, amplified right now. Yeah, right. Yeah, I drank six rock stars today just to part for this giant line of cocaine but, oh. but no just to okay. just to get through this this uh, show and just to you know think about you know what we talked about today and just to think about you know some of the gems and stuff that that even brett gave to us it's just it's just so cool just to think like our show has just touched people and we're mm -hmm. hearing back from these people that are you know doing things way bigger than we're doing or you know doing things to help children or something like that it's just it's so nice and you know for me like i definitely appreciate getting messages from uh, brett too I and mean, i gotta do a better job of getting back to him but he, yeah he's he's awesome about he yeah. sends me text messages same thing every yeah. morning yeah, yeah and it's just a few words and that yeah. but that's what that means it, it, it just is awesome because yeah. you have somebody that that took the time out and it, it doesn't have to be a long long thing just mm -hmm. re being recognized is uh, pretty amazing mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yep. Mike, what about you? I'm excited to get Lisa's book. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm I'm really excited to see that and uh I hope other our listeners and me, even you guys will pick it up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get you it. You know, it, it would definitely behoove us to I think it would help us with our show. I think it would help us in our personal lives and so I don't see a reason why you don't get it. Yeah. yeah. Very good advice. Well, boys, it's been a great one. Thank you, Gary, very much for getting that set up. That was a, a wonderful gift. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> You're, you are worthy, Mike. <laughs> That's you what Lisa says. Worthy. We're worthy. <laughs> we are worthy. And with that, we go.